Hi, welcome to the Reproducibility Podcast Season Two.、Uh, this is William, and I'm Sarah. And yeah, this episode we'll be chatting about how we recognize scientific contributions, and more specifically, we'll be talking about、um, the credit model. So that's the contributor roles taxonomy, and why potentially. We think that、uh, model is better than our current authorship.、Mm-hmm. Yeah.、So. Before we start, I just want to acknowledge that I'm coming to you from Saint John's. This is、uh, ancestral Beothuk, and the island of Newfoundland is part of the traditional territories of the Newfoundland. Me- and I'm coming from Chicago, and those are the traditional lands of the Potawatomi nations. And I want to just respect that and acknowledge that. So, yeah. yeah. So you wrote an, an article about. Credit. Well, do you want to give us a bit of a summary of of what you talked about? Sure. Let's.、Uh, so this might be a long summary. Let's start all the way from the top.、Okay. So our current scientific output,、um, for the most part, papers, scientific papers.、Mm-hmm. That's what all scientists aim for, and produce. And so the way it works is that uh, usually uh, contributions to a paper. Are recognized by authorship, so you would have your authors' names listed with the article, and usually the first author denotes the lead on the research project, and the and most disciplines the last author is the senior author or the main supervisor of the discipline. It's this varies a little with the,、yeah. the senior author thing. I,、um, as an assumption、chat. that I hold, and I I was. Told a couple of times that like no, that's not how it works, or like oh, I didn't know that. That's not how it's interesting. Yeah, I don't. So even that's, that's idiosyncratic. Yeah, I don't think that's typical APA、um, recommendations.、Uh, okay. So I'm not sure, but anyway,、um, part of the issues here include that、um, we don't see who contributed which parts of the work to the paper,、mm-hmm. and there's other、um, problems such as. Uh, certain guidelines in the past、uh, that have been upheld by journals usually recommend that you have to write part of the paper, like you have to be、yeah. have contributed to the writing, and this、uh, leads to other issues. So,、uh, yeah, and then so I wrote an article about this, pointing this out, saying, for example, that、um, the work because some people might only contribute the data collection or the programming. To、uh, an experiment, which is super important, like the work wouldn't、right. exist without it. Right, exactly. But they, if they don't actually write a word in the manuscript, then they might not be recognized as an author,、hmm. and they might be left to、um, the acknowledgement. So that's an issue, especially when、um, because of our current incentive system,、uh, the main currency for showing your Worth in science are first、Kicker、author publications. <laughs> yeah, yeah.、Um, as in, that's what most scientists are、yeah. evaluated on at the moment. Yeah, hence the publish or perish、yeah. structure system where most scientists are gunning for first author publication. And yeah,、uh, you've already highlighted that this is a problem for those people who are doing very important work. Such as the data collection, or perhaps the conceptualization,、mm. uh, or you know, ensuring the rigor of the work. Maybe going in and analyzing the data、uh, after it's been collected or been tested to make sure the analyses are reproducible.、Mm. Uh, that work can be may not be recognized with authorship, and so this、yeah. is a term usually referred to as this is usually referred to as ghost authorship.、Yeah. So that's、um, that, and、uh, pit. Studies have shown that it's usually the junior scientists that are doing that kind of work.、So、it's usually the junior scientists that are collecting the data.、Yeah. Um, one might might one might consider a situation where, for example, an undergraduate、uh, research assistant may be doing the data collection,、uh, but they may not be、uh, included in the paper, which I think is、uh, unjust. Absolutely. And, and you can also get the flip side where、um, senior authors, despite not doing That much for the paper may be able to demand authorship, especially with the current structure systems where they have power. And essentially, authorship will be、um, uh, allocated or decided by whoever's on top. 
usually the senior. An extreme example I think I've seen or heard is that there was a, a piece about a, a really prolific scientist and he published 150 papers this year. Like, but what? <laughs> that, that can't be a thing. <laughs> like, you did not write 150 papers. You've got your name on it. Cause, right, exactly. Like, how much work so, did you actually put in each? Right, so... It seems like this kind of uh, authorship system, the way this way we recognize people's contributions to science mm-hmm. adds to the inequity of our structure. And mm-hmm. yeah, it simply doesn't, it's not effective. It's not a good way of doing it. No. Um, so in this article that I wrote for the APS Observer, it I raised that uh, a contributorship model might be the better way to go. So uh, what that means is that you would have so i'm going to use credit which is um, so the contributor roles taxonomy which is a framework for doing contributorship and so what that is is you've got different roles so i'll just read them out so there's conceptualization data curation formal analysis funding acquisition investigation methodology project administration resources software supervision validation visualization and writing of the original draft and writing of the and and review and editing of that draft so those are the sort of um roles that uh one may have in producing a scientific paper and rather than listing just the authors and relying on order like relying on first authorship and so on and so forth uh, we can actually put people uh say what people what people did right Mm -hmm. we can include um, what roles people took on and so this I think is more equitable especially for early career researchers because we recognize the work that isn't necessarily the writing of the manuscript like the examples we've mentioned before like the researchers mm-hmm. and we sort of are able to then identify like what each author did what and what was important for the work and the idea is that that should be um, yeah that should be more inclusive right because we can see all the work um, that's go- that goes into a paper mm-hmm. and recognize that. And so not only do I think it's a more justified way of doing it, uh, it has benefits in that because this system can be machine readable, we can generate very useful metadata on what happens inside. And uh, so one dream of mine would be that if we all adopt the credit model and we all see these contributions, then we could then have... Um, recognition of the need for certain roles and specific roles or opportunities to do specific things because right now um, many scientists have to be a jack of all trades they have to mm-hmm. take on all of the roles that uh, i've mentioned with the credit model so you have to s- see through the project from start to finish mm-hmm. and sure that has some advantages but we also miss out on things like um, specialization and division of labor yes. and that would probably increase the efficiency in science um so this would make it make the scientific uh pursuit more collaborative and this would also sort of reshape the system so that you could potentially have more jobs and roles where people do the things that they really like or are really good at so for example if if you have a programmer um they'll be recognized for their work and they can create sort of almost a portfolio of all the things that they program for and then they could build a job and then so then scientists can diversify and academia can diversify what jobs um are available and have build a really strong research yeah that point uh, was particularly interesting to me i thought that was i hadn't thought about it that way like in relation to the credit taxonomy but it would be so nice i think to be able to have a specialty right? like we're all supposed to be statisticians well we're not we get like a basic introduction really in undergrad, and then maybe one course, maybe two in grad school. I didn't do psychology specifically in grad school, so I, I, I don't know. I've only had one stats course. Most of the stats I learned by myself because I had to. Right. But like exactly. it would have been cool, right? And probably would have much more robust statistics if we had statisticians do that work or certain scientists specialize in statistics and then get that recognition. Then you don't have to necessarily be first author. It's just how many papers have you done or how many projects have you contributed to as a statistician? Then people can see the breadth of your work. Right. Exactly. It makes so much sense. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So that, I mean, I would, I personally would love a role where I could simply do just the programming, mm. like just the statistical analyses and just the data visualization, mm. or for example. Um, but you don't really see that kind of role popping up. A professional, uh, uh, 
experimental designer designer right like someone yeah, yeah, who designs yeah. just the experimental methods and i like think it exists more in that. the private sector from what i understand right. like consulting right like one of my friends keeps telling me like you should just go into consulting like you would make so much money because so many organizations like die for quant skills really love mm. quant skills especially government and like you don't have to conceive the project they already have their project conception they just want you to look at the data and make the graphs or they want you oh. you consult on the design you know that consultant role, but it would be, yeah. I would like to see that built other than like having right. to build. Right. Not. Yeah. Um, I mean, it would be nice to see like sort of, yeah, people who are more the executors, right? Um, yeah. If that's their skill. And so then, uh, yeah, it just, for me, it doing this, having these kind of specialized jobs gives science two things. One is efficiency because division of labor so you're not spread thin across all these things and the second thing is rigor as you've sort of alluded to where someone can really get expertise and really train within a domain and then um, we should have more rigorous work as a result because they're not sort of they're not a hodgepodge of some stats learning stats some stats training some uh, programming skills, some like experimental design skills, some writing skills, like all of this, all of these things are useful and people should, um, maybe in research training be trained in all these things before they specialize in a domain, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, 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 that makes sense. So, yeah, I think science has a lot to gain from using this kind of model. And so, yeah. uh, another benefit that I mentioned in the article is that maybe we can move away from this publish or perish structure so by simply nice. yeah by simply re recognizing what goes into research what goes into the work mm -hmm. um you incentivize that work because think about the flip side if you're not going to get a paper out of it right if you're not going to be recognized as an author in the paper what incentivizes you to do that <laughs> you're unlikely to you know help out with the programming if you're and you just end up in the acknowledgements, right? Yeah. Um, so building an incentive to do that kind of work and reward that kind of work, uh, I think is a good idea. Uh, and also, yeah. it encourages collaborations, right? Because now you can work with yes. this person and provide your set of skills. So then it's as, as we uptake this contributorship model, um, I can envision these sort of authorship incentives or authorship pressures sort of weakening over time and sort of moving away from that system seems uh inequitable yeah yeah i really does like that, that as does well that make sense to you? yeah absolutely he's like i'm thinking about my projects right now i'm first off and because i initiated the project i conceptualized it i'm doing most of the work i get help with data collection but everything else i do because it's the only way that i'm gonna get credit on my cv for it Right, that's the mm. that's the only way right now for me to really line myself up to look good for a job. But even like within our lab, there are enough of us that if each of us helped each other out, we would all like triple our our paper limit, right? Right. Just by working together on those projects, contributing some, helping each other with data collection, helping each other with analysis, helping each other with editing, whatever, mm -hmm. brainstorming. At any point, if we can have more collabor collaboration, then suddenly we all multiply our output quite a bit and probably that work is going to be better because there are more people working on it with different perspectives that will identify different problems right yeah and science should be a more you know collective and collaborative pursuit and yeah. we could then get a bit more consensus on the things that we're discussing and working on. so one of the issues is that this kind of pressure to generate a lot of first author publications is that's what all scientists are pretty much evaluated on rather than any second author slash other position. Uh, yeah. So by moving away from that system, we can slow down. Like there's been a lot of talk of trying to slow down science. We produce so much papers. There's so many papers and that's increasing, by the way. There's like a ton of papers that scientists can't even read. Like we mm -hmm. as ourselves can't even read the content that other scientists are producing. Mm -hmm. and there isn't much work going on to you know, like, get consensus on the questions we are asking and the approaches and so and so so having a more collaborative and like having a few more stakeholders i suppose in each yeah. research project stands to make it a bit more 
valuable, effective, rigorous, and so on and so forth. So for me, I'm not sure that consensus is necessarily a goal, but I do think that we can certainly benefit from more conversation. Like I, I don't have much time built into my day-to-day work, my weekly work for reading other papers. I only read other papers when I'm writing something and I have to look other like reference prints. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, and I was told early in, in grad school that like, once a week to go and look what's being published and just like browse the abstract so you keep up on what's what's going on. And I follow a sense and I try to do that for a while. But you're just so overwhelmed with that to do that that falls by the wayside. And then like I know that I'm honestly like kind of vaguely aware of really what's going on in my field. You find out at conference, that's a good way to get like a glimpse. But it would be nice to be able to slow and take the time to really read and really take in other people's work rather than trying to read to like find the thing then reference Right. Mm-hmm. That's something that mm-hmm. I came across as pointed out as extractive. That's another way in which capitalism has infiltrated and taken over really, I think, academia. This and and colonialism, right? That this extractive idea of oh, we only mine papers for our own gain. And it's not about exchange, it's not about conversation, it's about how can I take this for myself so I can if we were able to slow which this credit could help with overall, then we would be able to have more conversations. And I think that would be right. Absolutely. I totally agree. And something uh, that came to mind when uh, you were talking about that, about how we need to start conversations and how we can't possibly consume all the content that is being produced uh, is that, yeah, in this sort of system now where we're overwhelmed and flooded by all the research that's being produced, uh, there's a game where people need to increase the visibility of their work and they'll do things like go to Twitter and so and so. And I also think that adds to the inequity of our structures because it's going to be um, like people who are closer or net in network with the power players in the system will get the visibility and will get the citations. And like that's not equitable when citations are also a metric that scientists are evaluated on uh, and it's not a not merit merit driven so uh yeah I, that's why i think pushing towards a credit model or contributorship may be a way where we can nudge or push towards a slower science because there'll be more rigorous work that's collaborative so you'll have firstly you'll have more contributors in the one project so all those contributors should be aware of that research already but also, yeah, that there'll be just less uh, proliferation of the content and specific rigorous collaborative mm-hmm. projects. So, yeah, that's, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, because there's definitely an assumption, and again, I, that comes from capitalism, that more is better. But it's always about growth. We always have to produce more and more and more. And that's how you get success. But like, I think we're reaching a point where it's becoming uh, obvious to me, at least, that that's not sustainable certainly you know it's obvious to me but yeah obviously to me that like that's just not a reasonable goal to have for us like yeah is our goal really to just make more i don't right. to me that's not the purpose of science it's not about making more there will always be more right can we take our time to do these things well to think through what we're doing and how we're doing and it what is or if it is we want more what is exactly it is that we want more yeah. of. And for me, that's like scientific truths <laughs> and evidence, solid evidence. So, I mean, I don't know about the tact- idea of truth, but that's yeah, a yeah, discussion. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is a goal. Yeah, that's right. Um, switching, switching tact a little um, and going back to sort of this article that I wrote, uh, I was writing it from the perspective of, an, of early career research because currently our publishing incentives i think put a lot of burden and pressure on junior scientists mm-hmm. and uh it's almost unbearable <laughs> yeah, um, it, it's it overwhelming. is so i want to highlight and advocate yeah. for um this model and how it makes it a little bit better for early career researchers and i mentioned this in the article read it the first is that um we talked about this a, a little in that junior scientists are the ones that will tend to lose out with current mm-hmm. power dynamics in our structures. So uh, even if they think they're deserving of authorship, it would be tricky for them to bring that up with a scientist or their supervisor and say, hey, I think I deserve recognition. And if 
that may generate conflict and those conflicts are going to mm-hmm. be decided along power differential and mm-hmm. even if you get what you want for the results of the conflict or the the resolution you might start to get long term effects where you're the difficult student who's always trying to get credit for their work so on and so forth so mm-hmm. it's definitely not an easy situation i think the credit model uh handles those issues uh better because one these roles are explicitly defined and you can have this discussion as to what is required for authorship from the start of the project for example uh anyone who uh does x amount of data collection or collects 5 hours worth whatever um will then be recognized with authorship on the paper so those dis- the, it it's a good framework to have these discussions and make explicit standards for what um should be recognized mm-hmm. as contribution to the project and again you can have this before like you don't like a lot of these sort of authorship conflicts come at the end right when the manuscript is written mm-hmm. and because people don't have these discussions and then you get sort of um you might get a that's where you might get the conflict right at the end where people are arguing over where they should be on the paper um so yeah i think that system helps out early career researchers because it makes transparent what the expectations are for the work Yeah, it provides a good framework for the discussion and to get agreement between you and the senior supervisor. Does that sound good to you? Yeah, and I came across and I used to think of a, a system for designing authorship. I think it was in a cool. video by the Clear Lab, which I talk about a lot. I think they're awesome. They're a feminist anti-colonial lab here at Memorial University that do plastic and they were talking about the way that they designed author lists. And as, if I remember correctly, they start with a brainstorm mm. of every who contributed to that work, which includes things like the fish <laughs> and the lamb. And then they whittle it down and then they figure out the order. Like, as far as I know, I've not, I don't think fish have made the author list. Maybe they're in the acknowledgements. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, but that's an important part of it, right? So they're recognizing that, you know, these beings gave up their lives for us to do our work. And that is worth recognizing. And so even just like that concept of, mm-hmm. of thinking about everything and along those lines, I think as much as I do like the credit at taxonomy and I have used it and I do see the benefits, of course, I was also mm-hmm. want to ask mm-hmm. what's missing. What kind of roles, what kind of work is missing from this? And the most obvious to me is things like care and emotional. We all know from experience do, doing science is also is emotional, right? Like you're going to come across failures. You're going to come across barriers, hard times, things not working, trouble with, I don't know, paperwork or what have you, people not showing up, participants dropping out. There's all sorts of emotional labor that goes into producing a paper and the forms of labor that are recognized in the credit mm-hmm. taxonomy versus yeah. care and emotional. You could interpret that also as, as gendered labor, right? What kind of labor is recognized and labor isn't, and that is gendered mostly. That's That's a very gross generalization. But I think that given things in general, we can, we can bring that argument up and say, you know, we're, we're missing the value of care and emotional labor for each other. That is very real in this work that we do. Absolutely. 100%. I totally agree. And I agree that credit is going to be imperfect. There will be some holes. But despite that, it's a, still a lot better than the current authorship model where All of that oh, is sure. missing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. I was thinking, like, as you said, that list of roles, which you know is a good refresher, you could, in the current system, choose to recognize those under project management, for example. Like, you don't I have to say right, in the yeah. paper and support, but you could put someone's name in and label it as project. I think that's probably the the closest mm-hmm. descriptor. Right. But like, that's if you choose, right? Like, if you choose as a lab or as a researcher to recognize, and that's not explicitly incentivized. So it would be like even better. Yeah, support you have some that. Like care. Who right. did someone, you know, someone bring you coffee? Did someone make food or snacks for, for you for the lab or listen to you, <laughs> you know, when you were real sad about something? Yeah, support you, right? Like where's where's that work? I mean, you think about um think about movies, right? And then the whole credit list that plays at the end of the movie. Mm-hmm. It's not just the actors and the people who appear on the screen and not just the camera directors and so on and so forth. You do have like the support crew, the catering, the that kind of yep. the staff, 
like they appear yeah. they like, hundreds and they're recognized on that credit list so yeah um uh another thing about the um, credit model that i think uh is good for early career researchers is that it explicitly like like going into your first project at least me going to my first project i didn't even think about any of this like i had no idea about authorship standards and so on and so forth so it just makes clear to the early career researcher i'm thinking here like more specifically like the early grad students or the undergraduate oh, research assistants they ha- can yeah. they explicitly know what the expectation for their research is and for that what their work is and what is um what mm-hmm. what they're meant to be doing right yeah and lab managers all can get yeah. credit like right now it Absolutely. feels like lab managers is a right. sort of lesser role to the like academic track people are doing real research but like the lab managers are critical to making the lab run and they help with data collection the logistics yeah. they help like you know the maybe that role would become i don't know what the best word is but like i don't know more respected <laughs> maybe in academia like that's a that's a valid job to have and if you get your name on on papers for that then it's like oh yes and you can see mm-hmm. as a lab manager here because in a system we have to show like numbers and value that way which sucks but that's like <laughs> a different problem if we're dealing with it, we have to have papers then that's a way that we have credit there and create maybe these specializations in the lab like you can hire someone who's a stats you can hire someone who's a method specialist for the lab i know some labs bigger or more technical like the the live lab in the cluster the big like concert hall i don't know it's a it's a it's a concert hall that's a okay. lab that's exciting so it's got like huge amount of speakers so you can make all uh-huh. sorts of acoustic uh-huh. environments it's got like a moving stage you can have eeg for four wow. performers you can have eeg wow. for 16 people in the audience and there's like all sorts of oh it's it's amazing i i visited it when it was built and i i never got into mcmaster after my undergrad so i've not been able to work there but it's a really cool lab and like they have specialized lab techs like their only job is to you know their their job is to be the the, the technical specialist for the lab right and i'm sure like motion capture i as far as i understand also usually have a person yeah. who's like the motion capture person who takes care of the equipment who knows how to run it all who you know who does this work thinking like fmri techs i'm thinking yeah. like even for low-level psychophysics people who calibrate the monitors yeah. and use those tools yeah like, i think those should the kind of work should be recognized in science and you know one could imagine as a pipe dream that when we start to recognize the work and credit the work we can eventually have people build portfolios of that work and create career research uh career research careers out of doing that work right yes yes i think it's partially anti-capitalist yeah. like we're not overthrowing the whole system but there, there's but like that's not how it works right you, you chip away at it <laughs> to me a, to me a solution, right we all we chip away at it in thousands of different ways and undermining this individuality working more collaboratively and recognizing that work going slower fighting the pressure yeah. abuse like all of these mm-hmm. things are part of the anti-capitalist project which i think is overall good for academia because our being no no overrun we're we're trying so hard to, to I think, keep this an intellectual project, but the neoliberal forces are, are so, so strong, and it's a struggle. Yeah, absolutely. And so one of the things that I love about credit is that it feels like a fairly simple behavior that, that, that could be undertaken at the individual slash mm-hmm. lab level, uh, rather than uh, a lot of initiatives sort of rely on institutional favor and requires some sort of top-down work for example like grants journals and things. um so but i think it's a very easy thing to apply at the individual level because all it takes is starting a discussion and saying hey i don't think we should rely on this authorship model anymore we should use contributorship and talk about credit and have the relevant stakeholders within the lab or within the individual research project um talk about it right and and eventually if we can get yeah. more people to on the ground to uphold that then yeah then we'll have more equitable recognition of uh the work that goes into science and so yeah yeah so what do you think the barrier is to that like it like you said in in, in your article it's what thousands of journals have now adopted this so it it feels like it's being uptaken so 
like is it is it really and if not what what do you think the barrier is and how do we make that change more prevalent right so uh not all journals uh, provide a model or even like a typesetting for it um some people just uh, some journals shove the sort of credit into the an acknowledgement section which i don't think is quite the same so uh yeah i think uh essentially not all j- journals are just slow to uh, uh, update? No, that's not the word. Modernize? No, that's not the word. It's slow to adapt. Journals just are tend to, are slow to adapt to these kind of initiatives, like the formatting and just their structure. The submission forms not having capability of this. Uh, is that really that hard to do though? Like, what is there? Is is it just a practicality problem, or is there? Have you come across any like objections to the system as a whole? I personally haven't. I just think, yeah, it's sort of almost like a lack of awareness. Mm. Um, that's sort of the barrier from there. And I think, um, yeah, again, not a lot of, I'm, this is me think like sort of spitballing at the higher level mm-hmm. for now. Um, so yeah, I don't think journal publishers are just aware of it for the most part. Um, so that's that. And then the second is like, I don't think professional societies are norming these kind of behaviors or think about these kind of behaviors that they can norm. So it'd be, I think it'd be really mm. impactful if a professional society like, Hey, um, we, anyone who attends this conference, Hey, we should use credit model on your uh, posters or in your talks and so on and so forth. And yeah. so it's, I think that there's just a lack of initiative behind it, a lack of that. Uh, mm. but yeah, I think at the individual level, there's not many barriers. No. Um, Sure, there may be a bit of disagreement about what exactly are the standards and what the purpose of authorship is. So I can imagine a senior author being like, oh, I apply authorship to signify when people are qualified further. Like uh, I would give them authorship to signify they have the skills to apply for a PhD or something, which I think is pretty yeah. outdated and ridiculous <laughs> if you did but the work I can imagine that credit, like, right it. i think that should be and i think that should be the end of the discussion but i'm this yeah. is me trying to think of ways to yeah. push back <laughs> and that's yeah. what i can come up with um so yeah so basically i think at the individual level it should be pretty straightforward it's just a matter of taking a bit of initiative and having that discussion at least hook, uh i think best at the early stage of your research project but really at any point um and yeah, trying to norm those behaviors within the labs and within your yeah. institution, if possible. Um, yeah, so that's what, another thing I love about credit is that, you know, a lot of reform initiatives feel big and mm-hmm. maybe inaccessible or may not quite be ready. Whereas I think the credit model is something really simple that we can all apply mm. and could have, like, could have good snowball, right? I mentioned like the metadata that we get from this. I mentioned that people are simply going to get recognized for their work. Yeah, I think these are all good qualities that we would want in science. No, absolutely. I think it's a good call to talk about journals and the professional society is a really great way. So if anybody has maybe not even membership on the board or anything, but just be mm. a member of your society, you could bring it up to the board, right? Like I, I know we're, my institution, my supervisor is hosting a conference in September, but like they've already sent out the templates, it's too late. I don't know if SNBC is doing it. Look at their conferences this summer, but I could bring it up for a future one. And I don't think there would be objections as far as I know with my societies that I'm involved. But it would just potentially be a practicality of doing it. But like, just, I don't know, add it to the template. Is it, is it that difficult? Maybe a bit naive about it. But to me, it's just, like, just add it in. <laughs> like, what's the problem? Yeah. yeah. I mean, out of line. Well, well, you're still retaining authorship. So, like, yeah. You can still have, like, for example, in your submission form, the authorship field, and yeah. you can sort of order determined by that. I mean, that's another way of equitably determining authorship, right? It's like by how many of these um, contributor yeah, roles exactly. that you yeah. take on in the research project seems like a straightforward way mm-hmm. um, to determine authorship. So, um, yeah, and I think so. I think you, you retain the authorship field, and you have you just add a uh, contributorship field with the templates and it's simple tick boxes right like here are here are, add your authors and tick boxes i don't know it should be straightforward um yeah, yeah. i mean i've done it a couple of times but right? i have submitted to journals that have the credit taxonomy as part of of their process 
And I think it's just like for each author list the contributor roles. Um, and there and there are tools online that uh right. make it easy. Right. Uh, That's so it. I want to highlight work. It's called Tenzing, T E N Z I N G. It's a shiny app, which you talked about in past episodes. Uh, essentially, okay. you download a uh, Google Sheet template and fill it out, and then up- upload it to the Shiny app, and it will it will um, what's the word? It will generate ah. your uh, contributor list and your affiliations. It'll do all that work for you. It's automated, um, and it will have that cleanly. Um, it will spit out a clean text version for you to just copy and paste into your manuscript or into the submission form. So that's really handy. Um, that work is by, I think their name is Balak Saxel and Alex Holcomb, who's also a big advocate for the credit model. Yeah, so that's a pretty straightforward tool for applying credit to your next manuscript. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. So I guess in summary, mm-hmm. credit can be better at giving credit where credit is due. To repeat the word many times, um, it can increase collaboration and it particularly is helpful to early career researchers and to hopefully diversifying the types of jobs that we can get in science where people can special. For me, what's lacking is that there are certain types of work that are not in think about how we can use those. Yeah, things. that's a great summary. And I think if people are interested in learning more about credit, I'm going to make sure I get this website right. Um, I think it's niso.credit.org. So N-I-S-O dot credit, C-R-D-I-T dot org, O-R-G. Nope, I definitely got it wrong. Credit.niso.org. No, we'll link it in the, okay, yeah, the credit. Shop. Okay, so if, if, you're, if you're interested in learning more about the contributor roles taxonomy, learning more about credit, um, you can read a bit more about it at uh, credit.niso.org credit.niso.org and it's in the show notes. Any, awesome. any last thoughts? Any last words? No. I just want to say thank you for, for listening today. Thanks for joining us. Reach out to us if you'd like to talk about anything credit related or anything else. If you have any ideas for an episode, anything you want us to talk about, let us know. You can find me on Twitter at Sarah underscore Sobe. And you can find me on Twitter at Will underscore Nyam. And if you're interested in norming some of these behaviors like applying credit uh, at your local institution, you could start a reproducibility journal club. Yeah. Uh, and to get more details on that, check out reproducibility.org. See you next time. Bye. Bye. You listen to Reproducibility Season 2, Episode 8, Credit. Your hosts this episode were Sarah Sove and William Niem, who already told you their two handles and I should really stop repeating them at nauseam. This episode was produced by William Niem and edited by Jan Vornhagen. For more information on Credit, visit credit.niso.org. And for more information on reproducibility and how to start your own journal club, visit reproducibility.org. Thank you for listening. <laughs>